This is Sports Rage. Level three has begun. We were just talking about the Tennessee Volunteers in the Creighton game, which I said, I think this is going to be the, the – listen, they, they could all be close. This is Sweet 16. But I just sort of get the feeling that, yeah, this is the one. It's going to overtime. It's going to be crazy. Mm-hmm. Maybe a call here, a travel there, or whatnot. But I was talking about Dalton Connect. Uh, and yes. he, his pl- his player prop is 20 and a half. But this kid is legit coming from Northern Colorado. Can just, you know, pick and pop it. And it's just such a big difference for the Vols. And Tennessee are a lot like uh, Purdue are, uh, Griff, in the sense that, you know, everybody's on Matt Painter all the time. Rick Barnes has had a lot of failure in the NCAA tournament over the years. This might be his run right now with this volunteer team. As you stated, they had a couple of bad losses. They had those two losses in a row. But they also mm-hmm. had a run where they smashed Auburn. They smashed Alabama. Like, Tennessee right. went on a run and destroyed SEC teams for a while. Yeah, Gabe. You know, this the, the main key point in this game is going to be Dalton Connect. This is going to have to be their pivotal player. He's going to have to lead at the helm, and he's going to have to pop off early. He is going to need to score yeah, points. Because Creighton, 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 Creighton will hit some threes. Exactly. And Creighton's one of those teams that, you know, they, they play aggressive basketball. They're not a team that's going to get blown out by any means. In Tennessee, they play hard basketball. They either blow you out or they lose by a thread. They lose by a needle. Their defense is going to be key in this game. Their offense is going to rely on Dalton Connect. This kid's going to have to bang. Tennessee's great on rebo- rebounds and I'm going to be real with you, Gabe. I think this is Rick Barnes' year. I think that if Tennessee can take this game and move up next to the next set of uh, round, that this could put Tennessee in a very good position. Creighton right now, neutral site play, 3-3 three and three against the spread. 2-3 and three against the spread this season against raked opponents. And when playing games with four days off or more, they're just 4-4 four and four against the spread. This is a pick em game for me. I don't want any action on it. You put a gun to my head and you said, I got to pick one. I'm taking Tennessee just because they're a bigger team. They're more physical and strictly. Dalton Connect, I think he's going to pop off in this one against this Crichton defense. And shout out to everybody joining us on Series XM, Channel 159. This is Sports Rage. I am Maranci. We'll get Griffin Murphy. Uh, G Murphy wins on Twitter. Out of here in a minute. He's in Chicago. He's living in Vegas, but he's in Chicago. Hardcore fan. Man, for the White Sox, too. Like, like dude, like, what's going to happen if the Bears go to the playoffs or something? You're really going to, you know, you're going to be fucking Chicago a lot. <laughs> G- Gabe, you're speaking in fantasy land. I've been hearing Bears going to the playoffs since we drafted Mitch Trubisky. Debacle that was, Mahomes. If the Bears can finally put it together, we've got Keenan Allen, we've got DJ Moore, we've got Komet. We made huge transitions on the defensive side. DeAndre and I love Swift. To pick up that. DeAndre Swift at the running back spot, and I love the pickup that nobody's talking about, and that's Everett at the tight end spot from the Chargers. Him and Keenan Allen are boys, so obviously we're going to go pick up Caleb Williams now to be our quarterback. That puts us in a real weird situation because you had Justin Fields. You know, you had him for three, four years. The kid didn't get anything done, but the fact is he didn't have any weapons around him. Now you're asking yourself to put all of your chips in on a 21-year-old player. The kid balls. He proved it at USC. He dominated. This is not a system quarterback, but he doesn't have anybody really to veteran him. Like, I love the play that Pittsburgh made going and getting Russell Wilson and then having Justin Fields behind him because now they can prime him. This is the same thing that the Green Bay Packers did with Brett Favre and uh, Aaron Rodgers. Same circumstance with Tom Brady, Jimmy Garoppolo. The Bears need a situation like that. That is why I'm not going to get all high and mighty on this season. I want to see Caleb Williams play a full season long. I would have liked if the Bears kept fields, let him play eight, nine games, see how he operated. If he played good, let the kid play. If not, bring in Caleb Williams, let him get his snaps in, bring it into next season. So the Bears are in a little debacle. I love all the moves that Ryan Poles did make. He, they really did offset this entire Jalen Johnson on the defensive side. They are exciting, and it is exciting to get ready for this season. But I'm not going to be that Chicago Bears fan who's like, all right, here we go. This is our year. Let's do it again. I'm not there yet, Gabe. Yeah, and I agree with you as far as the quarterback situation with the backup. And you didn't do Justin Fields any favors with the talent around him. You didn't do him any favors with the backup around him either. You bring in like a D3 Tyson Bajan kid that wants his job. Right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Right. I was like, 
So it's like, yeah, what am I going to learn from this kid? Like, this kid, what, the arm, his father is going to kill me. He's the arm wrestling champion of the world, whatever. Right? Yeah, and, he was. Yeah, yeah, he was. So, like, and Bajan comes in, like, but he's competition. It's not he's a kid. I totally agree. And, yeah, I'm looking at the depth chart now. You got Bajan and, um, and Brett Rippin on the roster. Like, don't you want – you're exactly right, man. You need a vet around Caleb to say when Caleb walks off the field and go, all right, listen, like a Jacoby Brissett. All right, Caleb, this is, you know what? When they blitz like that, bro, just turn left or this guy's going to do this. Don't buy it. He always does that. They're selling this. What the hell are these kids going to tell you when Caleb is better than them? I totally agree. They got to get someone around him, good quarterback coaches and surround him. But the wide receiver help with DJ Moore, bringing Keenan Allen, bringing in Everett, that's a pretty veteran group like that he can lean on there right now, bro. Oh, hold on. I got to welcome the, the affiliates here. All right, let's roll. We're in the level three. This is Sports Rage. I am Gable Morenzi. The pistol parts, the hustlers, the people, the bust them, and everybody else in between. We're kicking it. It's the Twisted Tuesday. Countdown to the Sweet 16 is on. We've been throwing it down uh, for 120 minutes, but we got 108 minute full court press. Griffin Murphy from Doc Sports in the house uh, with us. He's in the Windy City right now. The Major League Baseball season is set to begin. What a big day on Thursday, Griff, as we've got Major League Baseball and the Sweet 16. The women's uh, tournament will resume, and that tournament's going to get lit with all the competition and the big-time heavyweight teams that are going to be going head-to-head. But on the way out here, uh, give us your pick once again. You're going to be all over Scooble in this game. You're going to. And uh, let people know where they can find you and your videos and your picks and everything that you've you got going on. Sure. So I'm going to give you guys right off the bat my best bet, and that's going to be take the Detroit Tigers first five innings against the Chicago White Sox. There's plus value in that play. I would assume it's probably a plus 130 line, considering the fact full game is uh, my, or plus 180 for Detroit. Scooble all season long last year, didn't he, he was outstanding first five innings, and they don't let him go deeper than six, in, six innings typically. That is my best bet. I think they are going to drill them, come off hot. The Chicago White Sox could be a, deba- a debacle for them this season. You can find me on Twitter at GMurphyWins, and I'm a professional sports handicapper at DocSports.com. Great stuff, Griff. Great seeing you uh, at the Super Bowl. Always a pleasure, my man. Uh, get it done this weekend. We'll catch up with you sooner rather than later. Enjoy the baseball game. Thanks, Gabe. I appreciate you having me on, brother. Always, man. Always a pleasure. Next time you're in Vegas, you make sure you give me a call, and we're going to have some fun, brother. Yeah, we might come down for the uh, – the. we'll return for the first round of the um, the NHL playoffs. I think it might be the Vegas Golden Knights and the Vancouver Canucks. We'll see how it plays out. Wild night tonight in the National Hockey League. We're not done yet. We're going to get into the uh, the news of the day. As far as the National Football League is concerned, they have a new kickoff rule. How's this going to change things? It will. Is it a positive? We'll get into the UFC Atlantic City, the Sweet 16, and more. Bring it. Season. All those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone, and you're not going to really have the 23, 24, 25 year old basketball players running around anymore. You're not going to have it. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on Sports Grid. The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes 
you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my God. My God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we did, did, got we, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. In. They still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they get scored them and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat you, Kyle. You got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. This is Sports Rage. I am Gable Morenzi. The pitch, the players, the hustlers, the people that bust them, and everybody else in between. Level three has begun. It's the calm before the storm. We got a wild week coming up, but a wild couple of weeks. Uh, Major League Baseball is back Thursday afternoon all day long. We got the Sweet 16. We got the women's tournament that's going to resume. Uh, that uh, Caitlin Clark had 4.9 million people watching her last game on ESPN. All kinds of NFL uh, news. NFL owners approve a, a radical new kickoff that is basically anybody that's watched the XFL and not the old XFL where they put the ball in the middle of the field and two dudes just ran and broke each other's necks and stuff like that. Then not that one, but it's kind of complicated to go over. Adam Schefter tweeted out a simple, he said, this is what it looks like. <laughs> I retweeted it. Uh, we can go, we're going to go over this a little bit later on, but uh, let's keep this Sweet 16 conversation going. Uh, right now let's bring in uh, kiev o'neill from the odds breakers and more kiev it's always a pleasure i man thanks for joining us uh tonight i want to take a little look at uh ufc atlantic city um that card whatever i haven't really focused in on it uh yet but they you know the ufc man they've got content to produce <laughs> so right really? they're going they're going to the boardwalk uh this week which is a cool location for them to go to but Let's start off with the Sweet 16. How's the tournament been treating you so far? It's been really well, actually. Last week, for up 14.7 units, uh, 12% ROI. A lot of it was from uh, the earlier stuff in the NAT. I started out 4-0. and Now, I had two close to even days, a little bit down, and two good days with the uh, NCAA itself. Now, uh, that Oregon beat at the end, oh, that, that one... My day would have been really good if, it, if we didn't have to deal with that over, double overtime, but it's been great, man. Yeah, speaking of the NIT, so uh, tonight, Indiana State gets it done, and this is you know shows how sharp the number was because it, it went up to like five, five and a half. They end up winning by four, but the game goes over the number. Uh, Georgia and Ohio State, game goes over the number. Georgia pulls off a road upset against uh, Ohio State, but I brought this up coming in, and if you notice the same thing, I don't know if you've been betting the totals, but they'll they'll tighten up again in the final four, the NIT and stuff, but for the most part, it's almost like a bowl game, right, Kiev, in the sense where coaches ease up, man, right? You know what I mean? Kids are still playing. They played a million games this year. It's sort of like, let's win, but let's have fun, and the overs, man, like I said, these games don't play to the under very much when you get to the NIT, especially early in the tournament. I've been killing it with the overs. Both games go over tonight. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's where I found my gold. I think Iowa's first total was like 152. It closed at 158. Georgia's first total was be six, and that closed in the 150s. That was two very easy wins in the first games of the NIT. I think it was Georgia versus uh, uh, it was a Big East team. I can't remember exactly who it was, but either way, yeah. I mean, these kids are are, are trying to showboat for the NBA a little bit, and playing a little bit less defense. It's not as big of a deal to not win the NIT. They're probably having a good time out there. I'm, you know, kind of happy for what the kids are doing out there. I'm glad they show up and actually play this and give us a sports better some value, you know, because we. We know they don't play a lot of defense, but yes, you're correct. But once even the NIT final game, I think the defense will, will tighten up a little bit. And obviously, just like the final four and the final games, those usually go to the under, you know. And uh, I think what's, what's important about the Sweet 16 and looking at these games is some of these venues, you know. You look at uh, Crypto Arena, which is, you know, the old Staples Centers. Nineteen lot of NBA venues. A lot of NBA venues uh, this, this week in the Sweet 16. So you're saying the Crypt... 19 and 10 to the under when it comes to college basketball this year? That's correct. 19 and 10 to the under. So um, now you have some big totals there. You have Clemson versus Arizona at 152, and then you have Alabama versus North Carolina at 173 and a half. So you have some big totals there. Maybe you can get a little cute like I do with the first half and uh, see what you can find for some value in that situation. Another one that has an eye opener, not a huge sample size, is TD Garden Arena in Boston. Eight overs and one under in this situation. Big sample size, but when it says... But it's not like it's six and three or five and four. It's eight and one here. So I, I do have to factor that into uh, looking at it towards an over arena, at least for now. You know, I'm always fascinated by you figure NBA arenas. I don't know if it's the sight lines or the lights. We talked about it last week. The Barclays Center is one arena in which it's just a pure stone cold under for college teams. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the lighting, if it's dark, you know, that's supposedly what it is. But it's just it's bizarre world. Like you figure, you figure LA. Like I said, you get an NBA sight line. You're getting you know NBA backboards, rims, etc. That you're getting a nice soft touch. Hard to get in front of the the total. I actually do like the over, but there's always that sort of trepidation, isn't there? When teams are off and they're coming back Thursday night now, there's going to be pressure. New sight lines. I always like the second game. When, you know, they've been in the arena, they've been in the city, they've gone through the warm-ups a bunch of times. You never really know how teams are going to react, but hard to see Arizona and Clemson not putting points on the board. Would you agree that this is, looks like an over? Yeah, it certainly does look like an over. I didn't touch the total in that one, even though I think that you have to understand that there's other reasons why these venues show shade to the unders. It's because just like you said, these this is a new arena for both kids. So it's like they're almost like a two away game feel, and it's much bigger. It's like um, almost shocking for them to get in there. And we know defense travels, but offense doesn't always travel right away. You know, there's nerves when it comes to it. There's officials that don't want to be the story of the game, at least in the beginning, and they don't start blowing their whistles because they don't want to be, you know, make a game into a foul fest and be the reason uh, a a big player fouled out. So there's even nerves with officiating. So there's a lot of reasons that these big end venues, even though you would think the NBA has these rims nice and soft, that they go to the under anyway. But in saying that, yeah, I mean, Arizona lives running the ball. You know, Alabama lives running the ball. Now, what I do like about Alabama, North Carolina, is maybe I'm going to look at a first half under 83, where I think that Alabama showed you that they stepped their defense up last week. In North Carolina, ranking number six in defense, where did this come from, from a North Carolina team that I've been brought up to see? You know, you, you, he's got it going different this year. And he really North does. Carolina goes on cold streaks themselves. So I, I think a first half under 83 might be a look, but I'm certainly not going under on the full total. Listen, I've got um, I've got an addiction problem when it comes to betting on overs. Like, uh, I'm like, I've never seen an over I didn't like, except, except when I look at this one, that's incredibly high, 173 and a half for Alabama and North Carolina. And I brought it up earlier. I think North Carolina, they're a better team. They're going to dictate the tempo. This game, they don't want to get into a 90-90 type game uh, with Alabama. Yet, North Carolina is still very good offensively. The difference is they can actually play defense. I do think the Tar Heels are going to eliminate Alabama. And I'll lay the four. I agree with that. I lean to the four. I think a money line 
is not a bad look at either at the North Carolina or find a dance partner with Marquette. And you're sitting there at plus 107 here. If you take two to both those my lines and pair them together here, you know, I, I, I'd be a little concerned with Bama following at the end, but this could be a blowout too. You know, I could, Alabama had it easy against Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon stiffed up at the, in that game. They were playing, playing just isolation ball a little bit of pick and roll but it was very easy for alabama to defend there's no ball movement they're just taking launching bad threes it was a situation where alabama was handing them opportunities to win that game and they just couldn't take it and then they couldn't rebound their free throws later so i'm not giving alabama a ton of credit for the way they beat grand canyon and uh, i think north carolina will have the ball movement and the defense to stuff alabama especially when you got guys like bacot and rj davis leading the way so definitely big lean for me on the four. Yeah, well, this is, like you said, it's kind of, you know, a big step up in class. I know there's disrespect to Grand Canyon, but they were so excited they won the game, uh, their first game, that it sort of carried yeah. over. Like you said, they got selfish. They didn't pass the ball. They played iso ball. And not to take anything away from the year the College of Charleston had, but Alabama beat College of Charleston and Grand Canyon. Now they're playing the North Carolina Tar Heels. <laughs> this is a... Like, it's, you know what I mean? You're stepping up in class now, right? It's just like, oh, no, we're not getting Grand Canyon again this week, guys. Sorry. You're getting Baycott and Davis and company uh, that have been a load to deal with. More with uh, Kiev on the other side. Bring it. season all those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone and you're not going to really have the 23 24 25 year old basketball players running around anymore you're not going to have it pharrell coast to coast only on sports grid The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my, God. my God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we, they, they, got they, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. They in, still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head -head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All we've heard you say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game, live, all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart Team. Winning back-to-back -back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game, live, prime time. Back-to-back, -back, just utterly stinker quarters. In-game, live, overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Okay. 
countdown to tip off is on. We're talking Sweet 16 uh, right now with Kiev O'Neill from the Odds Breakers. I am Gabriel Renzi. This is Sports Rage. Earlier in the program, we talked about the Frozen Four. We're 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 here for it all, right? Uh, the Frozen Four is going to be epic. The hockey uh, tournament starts later in the week, and we'll be all over that as well. Like I said, Thursday is going to be lit. Uh, with we got hockey, we got basketball, we got baseball. Major League Baseball starts. Clemson, Alabama is the first game up on Thursday night. SDSU and UConn national championship rematch from last year. How do you think this plays out this time? Is it a re- repeat from last year in which UConn won the game easily? Do you think SD- SDSU hang around more this year? It should be noted to everybody tuning in right now, the UConn Huskies went 6-0 and straight up and against the spread in the tournament last year and are now 2-0 and um, ATS. Eight straight tournament covers for the UConn Huskies. Hard to want to get in front of that, my man. I've already learned a couple times this year not to get in front of the UConn Huskies. You know, um, I've, I've been betting on them more, and that's been great. They're a great covering team as well. But, you know, they keep getting over-assumed, you know, because, you know, they lost some guys last year, and they're thinking, I'm just going to assume that they're going to take a rest this year. No, I, they're playing great, and uh, Hurley's giving them motivation. Is it warranted motivation? Not really. He's trying to be like, oh, they put us in the toughest bracket. Dude, you're playing San Diego State. You're not playing Auburn. You know, your side of the bracket became the easiest side of the bracket. Yeah, they got Northwestern. Anything. That's what I said, kid. But when the tournament started, everyone was crying about it. I was like, let it play out, man. Let's see how it plays. We don't know what the tough part of the path is. So, uh, real tough. They got know, Northwestern in their it's second game. Completely <laughs> in their favor. You know, they're, they're going to. Their, their toughest one is going to be definitely the next week. But so what? That's only one tough game. You got all these other big games and these teams duking it out. You know, Purdue's got to play Gonzaga, then Tennessee or Creighton. It's like, seriously, you can't stop it. But uh, at the same time, I hope to get a live line on UConn because it, it, the total's going down. It's 135 and a half now. And I don't lay double digit points when the totals are going down or that low, you know, it just tells me it's just a, a kind of like a rule of thumb when you're betting, you know, it's like, it, it, I don't care what the team's names are, whatever. I still lean to the UConn at 11, but I would, I'm hoping UConn has a stinker in the first half and Ladie kind of gets this team fired up on San Diego state side. And maybe UConn's down five, maybe they're close to even by the end of the first half. UConn's not, has it been the best first half team? If you know, then you fire away on UConn and, uh, you know, possibly get like a, a five or a six or something you're laying. Much better situation than laying 11 points. But at the same time, I think UConn rolls. I mean, they're the best team. I think if there's any other team that could beat UConn, I think it's Illinois. But, uh, you know, we'll get to that later. Yeah, I think, I think Purdue potentially could give them problems. I got Houston playing UConn in the championship game. We'll see how it plays out. One thing that's kind of flying out of the radar a little bit is the confidence of Hurley. And I don't know if he does this to put pressure on his team, right? Like, you know, obviously it's working, but a lot of times coaches will play down how good their own team is. And this is, this was uh, Dan Hurley after they beat Northwestern. We are bulletproof, elite offense, elite uh, defense, right? Doesn't think anybody can beat them. Right, like you don't hear people say this. I saw him in the interview uh, at the selection Sunday when he said, "Yeah, we got a tough path, but I don't think anyone can beat us. We're the best team in the country." (laughs) Like, he basically didn't seem phased by it, and it means a lot to him, his legacy, to get this second championship as well. He's doing a great coach, great job pushing the buttons, but I just don't. I'm not, you know, they're going to have to be really off for them to lose. I think in this tournament right now. Hurley's they just got the dial in. Northwestern, though, you know, and if they they only shot what made three threes in most of the game. And yeah, so they still very, won like, convincingly. That's the thing yes. with them. Even when they don't play well, they still win convincingly. And I'm and now I don't want to get in the way of that. And you know, it's just could be a repeat from last year. San Diego State benefited too a little bit. I thought UAB was going to have them, and they fouled out Davis, their only guy that could cover the D, and he had all ball too, just like Sanford did last week. He had all ball. It was down by one point. They called that a foul. It drove me nuts. No one's talking about that one, by the way. But uh, it's a situation where San Diego State's just uh, average, you know, an average good team, an average tournament team, I should say. Nothing special. UConn is a premier team. That's why you're seeing double digits, and it's warranted. You know, if I had made the spread, it'd be 12. So there you go. I think I just feel bad. I think, listen, San Diego State are clearly the best team for the Mountain West. They're the only ones that don't get their ass handed to them for the most part all the time in the tournament. 
made it to the title game last year. Dutcher does a great job. It's just too bad that they have to deal with UConn, right? This at this stage, at this stage of the tournament, uh, for them. And I also think San Diego State, it's kind of like one of those drop offs. We saw it with Alabama, man, when they scored like the hundred plus. They didn't light it up against Grand Canyon either. And I think San Diego State, they kind of played a perfect game against Yale, right? It's hard to follow that up, right? Like, you know what I mean? When you just sort of, you hit that top peak in which they just murdered uh, Yale on Sunday night. Illinois and Iowa State, a real battle here. We got the the Big 12 tourney champ against the uh, the Big 10 tourney champ here. I think people are sleeping on this Illinois team, uh, Kiev. What do you think about this game? They are sleeping on Illinois because their stats don't factor in a lot of those games, those six or seven games that Terrence Shannon missed. Terrence Shannon might be the best player in the whole league and maybe the best pick of the draft, in my opinion. This guy doesn't lose. He's uh, just, when he's down, he will fight that team back in. I've seen it many times. I'm a Big Ten fan. I watch him play. He is the truth in this team. And this team plays around him, but they also can play without him. They got a ton of three-point shooters. They got the number one efficient offense. And now it's against the number one efficient defense. If you look from a uh, uh, a Ken Palm type thing, I think Hazel Metrics has Iowa State the second best defense. But here's the thing. Iowa State's going to score points because they can steal the ball. They're actually number one, and uh, it's called a fast possession points, potential pick, quick points off breakaway steals. They're number one in that, and they're going to score against Illinois because Illinois doesn't play a lot of defense when they're up, you know, and they don't play a lot of defense actually when they're down, but they always catch up because they have a top offense. They got guys like Dane Danger in there just hitting all kinds of shots and getting those rebounds. Um, it's offense versus defense, but at the same time, I like the over. This is this venue, 8-1 and one towards the over, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And uh, Iowa State, quietly, their offense is fantastic. They were able to score against Houston. Um, it, it, they're known for a defensive team, but they don't have that one guy that can take them over the top, and that's where Terrence Shannon is. And that's why I think it's going to be close to a tie game with a minute or two left. Terrence Shannon gets the ball, takes care of business. Illinois advances to the lead eight. Total goes way over. They've been galvanized by that, too, as you said. They played without Shannon. We see when fans get on him, it sort of brings the team together and fires them up, actually. They have an us-against-the-world mm-hmm. mentality. They do feel disrespected. So, you know, this this is going to be a really fun game. But one of the best bets in college basketball this year, guys, was Illinois to the over. 26-10 and 10 to the over on the season. A buck 45 and a half here in this game. These games are going to be epic. Uh, this weekend, I'm almost already getting stressed out, you know, with my parlays <laughs> and like my final four, my hope that I can get this final four home and hit the 10 dimes for my $220 investment of uh, UConn versus North Carolina and um, Houston versus Tennessee. So that's my final four, Tennessee, Houston. But my one panic now, the one team that I'm starting to worry, what's your take? Am I underestimating Purdue? Has Purdue's play sort of see, you know, you just talked about watching all the Big Ten games, uh, being an original Wisconsin guy. What do you think of Purdue's first weekend, and how do they look coming into this weekend now? Well, it's funny that they put both Rick Barnes and Matt Painter in the same bracket because those are the big underachieving coaches over the years in the NCAA tournament, right? Always top seeds that were losing. Um, It would be amazing if they play each other. Right to, to end up getting yeah, to the final I, four. <laughs> I, I got them both favored in this game out of Purdue. They're just highly variant. And I hate how they say officials have to learn how to officiate. Video. No, you don't. You officiate them like you do a normal person because as a Big Ten fan, this dude had a lot going for him in the Big Ten. Purdue was the top free throw shooting team in the Big Ten. And if they weren't blowing teams out, they would have been the top free throw shooting team in the nation. I think they're top four in free throw attempts just because they're giving a lot of stuff to Edie. But, you know, if you saw that Wisconsin game, Edie's sitting there running Wisconsin over, pushing the guys around, smashing them, and they're calling fouls on the opposite team. I was like, do not listen to the Big Ten on officiating. But I don't know how they're going to officiate them because that's the highly variant part about it. To be honest with you, Gonzaga has the ball movement to move Edie out of the paint and get him on a post and then 
two passes later, somebody gets a free layup. They got that kind of thing. They got the mid-range shooting ranking number 42nd in mid-range attempts. Gonzaga's got the seventh best mid-range shooting. So they have the tools to beat Purdue, but I, I just don't know how it's going to get officiated. It's a highly variant game. That's my problem, too. I had the same problem with Purdue. Total 154 and a half. I actually brought up the, the a similar point earlier in the program, actually, when we were talking about this game, which I said, I see Gonzaga getting into foul trouble here, right? They're going to have to hit threes, play from the outside, because it's going to be a problem for them defensively and you know, offensively in the paint against uh, against Edie and Purdue. They have to hit their threes, and they have to stay out of foul trouble. Um, you know, But Purdue hasn't had any pressure yet, right? That's you know That's the whole thing. They didn't have any pressure in the first two weeks. But uh, Zach Eady had the best number since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And not Kareem, the fake one in Indiana State, the real one. <laughs> the real one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kareem. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Uh, it, is, know, it is what it is. And, and it's true. They, Purdue had the easiest way here. Um, Gonzaga at least faced an easy Kansas team that was beaten up. So they... I would say that yeah, they, they got Kansas gassed in Salt Lake after running and gunning with uh, with Sanford all night. Kansas hung yeah, in the first absolutely. half too, dude. It was they were up early. The wheels just fell off in the second half. It was unbelievable. I was actually impressed. Absolutely. Kansas were in the first half. Kansas were in the game. It was like 44, 41 or something at the it. half. The drive was my biggest play. This is sports race. tournament they win it then they go into the ncaa's and they put up a bucket load of points they have looked fantastic that's not the team that i saw in the regular season all those people that had all that extra time because of those covid seasons is going to be gone and you're not going to really have the 23 24 25 year old basketball players running around anymore it's not going to happen pharrell coast to coast only on sports grid The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it would call the foul. Oh, oh my, God. my God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we, they, they got robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. Got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. In, they still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game, live, all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game, live, prime time. Back-to-back, just utterly stinker quarters. In-game, live, overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. (laughs) 
We're going to get our boy uh, Lou Gamblu.com in the house a little bit later on in the week. You know, he's circling these UFC fights in Atlantic City uh, this weekend. Uh, Kiev also is a big uh, MMA better. Uh, you know, listen, you know, they're going head to head with the Sweet 16 here. They're in Atlantic City, little uh, local New Jersey, New York type of card. Um, they're looking for some entertaining fights uh, on this card. Taking a look at it, does anything catch your eye from a betting uh, standpoint here? Well, Chitty's fighting Ray's McKee, and I, I mean, Chitty's on a bad losing streak here. He was losing three in a row, and you know, I, I thought he was a little bit better than what he's shown lately, but he seems to be on the downfall. And this McKee kid is pretty young, you know, coming up here. He's a very aggressive kid in KOs and three submissions. He's two losses were by KO, but, and, you know, he has, he had, he lost to Angelusa. And, yeah, you know, that was back in September. And I, I might give him a pass for that and take a look at this situation being that he's a plus money, uh, you know, fighter here. I think he's kind of getting better, you know, coming, coming in. He's a welterweight here. Uh, right out of Ireland, too. So you know how those Irish fighters fight in the UFC. So that's when I'm kind of eyeing it up. I, I haven't had a, I've been studying Sweet 16 so much that I just barely looked at this card the last couple of days. But I think the main event's actually pretty good with Mano Fioro versus uh, Aaron Blanchfield. You know, both of these are pretty aggressive fighters. So I think this is going to be a fireworks one. You know, it's a women's MMA, but both of these fighters are over five significant strikes landed per minute. Um, it's going to be a standing fight mostly. Um, there might be a little bit of takedown attempts from Aaron Blanchfield, depending on how the fight's going. But at the same time, Fia Rowe is very hard to uh, put her in a bad situation. Uh, both of these fighters had a, an amazing strength of schedule, you know, um, fighting a, a lot of tough fighters. So uh, this main event's actually probably the best fight here. And obviously, Luke K and Buckley's not too bad. It's going to be a big, bloody mess by the time we get to the main event here. But I'm going to lean. Fia Rowe right now at the plus 160. Did I bet anything yet? Not just yet, but that's where I'm looking. You know and I know anybody that's been following the UFC for a long time knows it's always the lower name. Not that Chris Weidman's a no name, but you know what I'm saying? You know, he's he's past his prime, obviously, but it's always these type of cards that are the most violent and there's the most blood on the canvas, and you're like, oh, my God, you know, there's, what, a, what a crazy fight. I'm betting he over one and a half of uh, Buckley and Luke. Where can people find you online and uh, your breakdown of the games and the fights later in the week? Check us out at the oddsbreakers.com. We have a great totals guy coming on tomorrow, Kyle Hunter. And uh, we talk about the venues and how the uh, totals have been worked throughout the NCAA tournament when they're played in these big NBA arenas. So it's a really good episode for you guys to check out. It'll be out tomorrow at 2 a.m., uh, Pacific time, 5 a.m. Eastern. And obviously, there's a lot of free plays. We have some golf. We have some hockey. We have all kinds of good stuff over at the Odds Breakers. And uh, uh, Gam Lou's coming on. Shout out to Gam Lou, too, for your show because uh, Gam's a good friend of mine and an amazing UFC better. Yeah, and Kyle's a great capper uh, as well. So uh, great stuff. Enjoy the games uh, this week. We'll catch up with you down the road, my man. Always a pleasure. Thank yep, thanks for having me, Gabe. We'll be talking. Uh, great stuff uh, with Kiev O'Neal uh, kicking it uh, with us on a Twisted Tuesday. We'll get back to the UFC later in the week. Like I said, Lou will join us. But I do like, like I said, like the UFC knows, you know, they know how to book fights. And they, they know how to make an entertaining card made for TV, uh, so to speak. Especially going head-to-head -head with the Sweet 16. I guarantee you, they want one of those fights where people are going to call each other. Oh, look at the fight that you're missing. Uh, right now, and Luke and uh, Buckley could be that fight. Basically, a pick them over one and a half rounds is minus one uh, seventy five. So, um, shout out to uh, to Kiev for kicking it uh, with us tonight. This is Sports Rage. I am Marenzi. A couple of other uh, things I want to get to. I want to check in with the women's uh, updated women's point spreads of the women's uh, tournament, and I want to check in with the National Football League draft as well. If you're just joining us, we brought it up off the top of the program that the National Football League owners approved the new kickoff uh, changes. So basically, if you've watched the XFL, this is what they've done in the XFL. Um, under the new rule, 10 players on the kicking team and at least nine players on the receiving team must line up five yards apart from one another at the receiving team's 40-yard line and 35-yard line, respectively. 
So the defense is going to be, you kick off, the defense is going to be on the 40-yard line of the opposition, and you're going to be lined up on your own 35 to block them. The kicker will kick off still from his own 35-yard line. Players are not permitted to move until either the ball reaches or is picked up by the player in the landing zone, which is defined as the area between the receiving team's 20-yard line and the goal line. This already sucks, as you can tell. Uh, if the kick goes out of bounds or lounge short of the landing zone, the receiving team will automatically get the ball at their own uh, 40-yard line. If the ball lands inside the landing zone and bounces into the end zone, the receiving team will have a touchback at their own 20-yard line. If the ball is kicked into the end zone on the fly and either goes through the end zone or is down, the receiving team will get a touchback on the 30-yard line. Yeah, because this isn't confusing. As we stated, um, I tweeted out the video, Adam Schefter, I retweeted Adam Schefter's video, in which he just basically took a video of, like, the, the XFL kicking off, so you get a look at it. But, so, you know, as I stated, one team on the 40-yard line, the other team on the 35-yard line, there's only a five-yard gap, and you got your returners waiting for the kick. Last year in the XFL, there was one touchdown return on on kickoffs so it didn't lead to any sort of like real craziness there was a couple of good returns and stuff now it got approved 29-3 um they were extremely for this in the national football league coaches including sean mcdermott um and others but i saw sean mcdermott talking uh, and he had a funny anecdote about kickoffs and he said you know now that they're, they have this format. He goes, maybe the star players will want to do it. And he goes, he said, he goes, I got to be honest. He goes, not a lot of guys are putting their hands up, but I asked them who wants to return kicks. <laughs> so in other words, Stephon Diggs is like, I'm not returning any kickoff, right? But will it be any different now? Maybe. Um, there's another thought that, oh, like, oh, teams are going to look for, like, in the draft now for people are going to be able to return. Now, listen, there were no returns. You know, everything was a touchback all the time now. So there are going to be returns, but it's so it's so condensed that it's hard to get a big return because nobody can really get a running start, right? Right? So, like, it's very, it's very demolition derby-ish. Even though, like I said, even though it's, you know, the kicker is still kicking the ball off, it's almost like an extended, like, pitch back. Like, it's like a run play, almost, except the, the running back is starting, like, 10 yards or 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage instead of seven or eight. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine, like, you know, the quarterback pitches the ball back, but he really pitches it back, like 15 yards or something, and then Buddy's got to go through everybody. Right? I mean, there's only five yards separating everybody. <laughs> so, like, how much... Right, so basically everybody on the line just sort of collides. And like I said, there's a couple of times, you know, I could imagine maybe somebody like, you know, you know, Debo Samuel could be good at getting at the corner, right? I mean, guys are going to try to get to the corner. The real deal is, and, you know, I, I heard, you know, Adam Schefter talking about coaches weren't, you know, weren't excited about this because now it's just another headache they have to worry about. Right, they've never coached this. They've never. There's not one. They never coach. Right, unless you were the special teams coach or you're coming from the XFL and you're in the NFL right now, you've never done this before. So now you've got to be like, really, I got to worry and come up and worry about the flaws and how we're going to get burnt on this somehow. We're going to lose a game because we didn't think of some stupid way that this team just came up with to burn us on this. Right? Who's going to be the first coach to come up with something really creative on it and figure out this is how you're going to beat this? Right? This this is how we're going to screw the other team over on this kick. I don't think people are going to like it. Like I said, I like the XFL. I like you know I love the United States, you know the the USFL, the XFL. They're now merged, obviously the CFL. So I'm open to different rules and formats and stuff. But this is one that I never really thought worked. Right, like watching, you know, watching the XFL games, like I said, it's just very condensed. 
right? So they kick the ball off. It's like a quick run, and boom. And I don't know how much safer it is. There's still impact, right? You're still getting hit. There's still You're still catching the ball behind everybody. The only difference is now the guys on the other team aren't, like, flying down the field, right, anymore. They're already there. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I guess a good way of explaining it, it's almost like a hockey trap. You know, just imagine, you're, you know what I mean? You're catching the ball. The other team is already lined up at your 40-yard line. So are you really going to get past that? Yeah, I guess, you know, we'll see how it plays out. But I'm not really overly a fan of this. At this point, just, you know, give the ball, the just give the teams the ball in their own 25-yard line and drop the kickoff of this, you know, at this point. You know, there was a lot of talk about the hip tackle uh, over the last couple of days. Players are not happy about the hip tackle, basically tackling some from behind and pulling them down, which I really don't know how defensive players are supposed to take somebody down anymore. It seems like every defensive player agrees. And this is something actually that will just lead to more overs. Because more and more, you can't tackle anybody. Players are going to, like, not want to get fined and just say, screw it. Whatever. Like, I'm not getting fined again to tackle someone or whatever. So I'm not going to do it. And Buddy's going to get the first down now. Or I am going to tackle the guy the old-fashioned way and not care. And I'm going to get a 15-yard penalty. I'm going to get fined for it. Right? So... You're putting defensive players in a no-win situation, which, you know, just lead to more points in the big picture. But the biggest thing that kind of, like, is ridiculous that's flying under the radar is the fact that they took away the the onside kick. You can't do an onside kick in the NFL anymore until the fourth quarter of the game. And you can only do it if you're trailing in the game. And you have to tell everybody that you're doing it. You have to report that you're going to do it. That's like asking a baseball player to tell everybody that he's going to steal second base on the next pitch. Think about it. The New Orleans Saints beat the Indianapolis Colts in the Super Bowl, and the turning point and the key reason they won the football game is because they took the opening kickoff, and then they onside kicked to start the second half, and they succeeded, and they scored. Right? Like, it... They, that was the game. It was like Indy were in shock. Like, we didn't get the ball. We got scored on. Like, this is a a disaster. And that wouldn't happen now. Like, New Orleans probably don't win the Super Bowl. The game would have been completely different. They don't, they they weren't successful on that onside kick. You just took that away. Like, I don't, you know what I mean? You already made the onside kick impossible to get as it was. So, to me, there's no reason for this. There was no reason to change the kickoff rule. Oh, there's too many touchbacks. Who cares? All right? Like, really, who cares? So kickers are stronger now. Like, you know, I I just hate these, like, baseball. Baseball is already, like, you know, destroying itself, and now the NFL is going down the same road. It's like the owners are bored every year, and they're sitting around on their yachts, and they have to come up without a screw up the game and with their stupid ideas. They have looked fantastic. That's not the team that I saw in the regular season. All those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone, and you're not going to really have the 23, 24, 25-year-old basketball players running around anymore. You're not going to have it. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes 
you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my God. My God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And oh, instead, we, we, we got we, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. They still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on SportsGrid. SportsGrid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning... Or you're rebuilding. In game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back to back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In game live. Prime time. Back to back just utterly stinker quarters. In game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Great stuff uh, this evening. Shout out to all of our guests for joining us. Kiev O'Neill from the Odds Breakers. We had uh, Griffin Murphy from Doc Sports, our boy to Rage Reddit, Cam Stewart, uh, in the house, Andrew McCannis from Wager Talk. We had a full house uh, tonight, the Wicked Wednesday. is always a solid show. Brady Cannon, uh, Paul Bovey, Ian Cameron. Wednesday is all business. And, of course, uh, it's golf night as well. Even though there's uh, March Madness going on, we'll do a, a quick golf segment uh, tomorrow with Brady Cannon. Uh, Brady's one of the best in the business when it comes to uh, golf handicapping speaking of a quick odds check uh, right now there's been a lot of talk about my boy jj mccarthy and whether he's going to go second overall and you know you can't believe anything at this time of the year and the media doesn't really know anything it's not like any nfl gm or owner is telling anybody anything right so you hear oh they like this and they like that like yeah they like everybody but i did i do believe this <laughs> that that dan quinn told people because all the coaches are in orlando now uh, Dan Quinn told people, anybody that thinks that um, they know what we're doing with the second pick is is making it up because we don't know what we're doing with the second pick. The Washington Commanders basically said that they're only now starting to like, you know, he said, we don't know, <laughs> essentially, which I believe. I've told people that before in drafts before, you know, like a week before the draft, days before the draft. I'm like, they don't even know who they're going to take yet, right? Like, things will change. I know Washington are in control of things because of um, of the fact they have a second pick, but I don't believe that Washington's locked in on anybody uh, right now. Brian Dable, New York Giant coach, basically said the same thing. One thing I'll, I'll say, though, Daniel Jones – Danny Dimes, you're done, bro. (laughs) The Giants aren't even hiding it, right? They're like, yeah, we're meeting with quarterbacks. It's an exciting, it's always exciting meeting new quarterbacks. Like, basically, like, Dable's still married, but he's out there, like, cruising the scene uh, right now already. I'm starting to think J.J. McCarthy's going to be a New York Giant. Other than that, you're on your own. Later. Later.